for the very first time. Welcome to Living Word today. I'm Pastor Pat. If we've not met already, and we're glad to have you, and for those of you joining us online as well, welcome to our service today, wherever you're watching this. I want to give a shout out to Sammy, wherever you are in uh, Nebraska, and so anyway, love you, and I was told you watch all the time. I love you, and so glad to see you today. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. Starting a brand new series today called Big Questions. And the month is going to be filled with big questions. Say, where'd you get these big questions? Well, usually uh, at Easter time, we pass out a survey and we say, okay, what questions you want to hear from the Word? We'll do a series called You Ask For It in the Fall. Well, we didn't get a chance to do that because COVID got in the way. And so this time, I got the, a series called Big Questions. You say, where'd you get those big questions, Pastor Pat? I made them up. But I believe there are questions that, that everybody's asking this time. And this is the number one, this is the only repeat in the bunch that we're due during this time. But we get asked this so much. I know it's one of those prevailing things, especially for those who may have a, a, maybe a different religious experience or no church at all. This is a big question. And that is, why do bad things happen to good people? And so we're going to talk about that today. As a matter of fact, I've heard a lot of folks talk about it from a standpoint of, their language kind of blames God for everything that happens. And so I want to try to sort that out with you today. And we're just going to use our Bibles to do that. Did you bring your Bible with you? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Bring your sword or what, whatever electronic means you have to get to your Bible. And uh, I do want to stop before we go any further, though. And I want to just say, Chris Ransom, Chris and Mary have been with us for several years now in our media department. And they are moving to Texas. Ah, oh, exactly. That's what I said when they told me. But we do want you to know that they have made a huge contribution to everything that happens media. If it has something to do with technology, his, his fingerprints have been on this. Also, Mary's helped us out on the Hope Truck to get all of that started. We will miss them terribly, but we're thankful for their contribution. Come on, can you give them a big hand clap and thank you? Come on, give them a big hand clap. Because there's been times... There's been times when we, didn't, we had an empty sanctuary and everybody was right through that lens right there. And so they were responsible for that. And we're so thankful for them. The whole media team is so thankful for their love and input and partnership and friendship that will go on forever. Amen? Amen, amen. All right. So what, what are we dealing with today? Again, why do bad things happen to good people? And I, I'm going to unpack this in a way that... Uh, I, I pray it's, it's in a way that you can digest it. I have a lot of scripture for you today, okay? Matter of fact, I guess I need to publish these so you can kind of examine them a little more closely. But if you want to walk by faith, come on, how many of you want to walk by faith, a real strong faith that overcomes this world? Amen. You have to have this element or your faith has a hard time working, okay? And so if you, don't, if you think God is your problem, or the reason why bad things are happening is somehow or another it's the will of God for your life. All your faith will be resisting the will of God. I had somebody t one time come up and they, and they needed healing in their body. And so anyway, I, I, I was getting ready to pray for them. I said, well, let me just ask you. You believe it's God's will for you to be healed? They said, no. I said, really? How come? They said, well, they, I believe God gave this to me and so forth to teach me something. And I said, well, let me ask you a question then. So did you take an aspirin or anything like that? I said, oh, yeah, I took one just a little while ago. I said, you took an aspirin to get out of the will of God? Come on, how many of you know none of these things make sense? Just intuitively we know that if there's relief to come, that I didn't need affliction. I had that before I got Jesus. What I needed was deliverance. I needed introduced to a healer. I should have got a better amen from the cheap seats back there. Amen. <laughs> amen. This world has got all kinds of different dynamics in it, and it can be a rough place to be. No doubt about that. If you're in Afghanistan right now, it is not fun. And so there's all kinds of not fun places on the earth, sometimes in the United States of America as well. We go through different things, and things happen in the earth that, that we have a tendency to kind of point our finger at God and say, how come you did this? Or, you know, why are kids born this way? Or why does poverty happen? Or why are people born on continents where they've never even worn a pair of shoes and, or don't know how to read? Or 
you know, why is it so hard? Why pestilence? Why COVID-19? All these different kinds of things that happen on the earth. Or why bigotry? Why do people just hate one another because they look different? By the way, how many of you all recognize sitting here, you look different? Is that okay? Hello. And so trouble, or to say there's no trouble in life, if you've got faith, you'll have no trouble, is a total myth. And it ignores a great deal of your Bible. Trouble, it comes with the planet that you're on. There is trouble. Matter of fact, Jesus gave you a promise. This is not one you even have to stand on the promise. It just happens. Jesus said in John 16, in this life you're going to have trouble, but be of good cheer. Why would I be in good cheer about trouble? Because Jesus said, I've already been there and overcome it. And so there comes that element of faith on top of that. But I'm telling you, this place can be a tough place to be. People can be mean to one another. Matter of fact, it can affect the next generation in the same household. And is it God's will? No. But there's decisions that have been made in previous generations that affect and consequence that comes into the effect of the next generation. Is it God? No. The devil? Probably. But humanity hooks up with the wrong thought pattern and then follows that direction, obedience to the devil, just like obedience to God. And it causes trouble and affliction and death that comes out of everywhere. And so let's talk about it from a Bible standpoint. Suffering, the Bible says in James, it didn't say you're not going to have suffering. It says count it all joy when it does come, but you got to know something. Count it all joy knowing this, that the trying of your faith works endurance, but when endurance has its perfect work, you're going to stand at the other side of that trial and test, wanting nothing, needing nothing, victorious. Amen? And so it's important for us to get that, or or that there's warfare, spiritual warfare that takes place. Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh, but we do war. Are you with me? For the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Why is that language in the Bible if there's no fight? Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life. Or we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers. Or wars and rumors of wars hit the earth. Come on, there's a whole lot of Bible about this. And if you get caught in the fray, my dear friends, it's not because God put it in the earth that way. It's because something happened to this planet that turned its direction towards evil. It's important for us to get it. Matter of fact, 1 Peter says it this way in chapter 5. And this is a guy that was an apostle of lamb, minding his own business, one day on the fishing and hadn't caught anything. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes by and says, come with me and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And from that time on, he grew into a brand new man. Simon became Peter. Uh, Peter went to jail and they were going to take his life. Trouble. You mean that anointed apostle, how could he have trouble? Man, he had faith. Even his, his shadow going over the top of people was getting healing for people. Man, that guy surely didn't have any trouble. He was up to his eyeballs in trouble all the time. Come on, are you with me? It's important. He's the one that said that the God of all grace who called you to eternal glory in Christ. Where did he call you? Eternal glory in Christ. That after the, you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Even the things the enemy wants to try to afflict you with will turn around and God will restore you and bring you strength and steadfastness. And so Paul knows what he's talking about. And so is there trouble in life? Yes. Why do good things, bad things happen to good people? Because you live on a planet that at the beginning in the book of Genesis in chapter 3 became cursed. And out of that came thorns and thistles. Out of that came anger. You don't even get out of the first family of the Bible before you have a murder. A homicide takes place before you even get out of Genesis chapter 4. And so it's important for us to understand that, that, that the planet that we live on, you shouldn't just assume that, you know, if God was good, how come? If God was good, how come? I'm answering that question today because God is good. How many of you know God's not moody nor petty? And by the way, there's all kinds of people that kind of size him up as being moody and petty and kind of a pick on you. You know, like God woke up one day as if he slept 
he woke up one day and said, you know, there's just something about you, Pat, that I just really ticks me off. I'm going to mess with you today. Come on, are you with me? And so we, we sometimes attach fallen humanity characteristics to a God that is untouched by all of it. And you just need to know that. And so generations who have gone before us, let me make this clear now, have made terrible decisions. And we still live in the consequence of those decisions. And it's important for you to know that all the way back to Genesis chapter number 3. And so creation, the Bible says, groans and travails, waiting for the adoption of sons. Even the earth is groaning and travailing, Romans chapter number 8, verse 22. And it's important for us to, to understand that even the earth fell with humanity. And so let's go back to the beginning and find out that everything in Genesis chapter number 1, when God, the very first book of the Bible, the Bible made the, the earth in six days of creation... And with that, the Bible says in every stage of creation, God says, and it was good. And it was good. Matter of fact, when he made the woman out of man, the Bible says it was very good. The Hebrew word for man is ish. Try it. Ish. ish. And that's not too glorious, is it? What is it? It's an ish. But when man, woman was made, it was ish. Ah. Come on, try that one. Well, I see, it even sounds better, doesn't it? That's an ish, that's an ish. Ah. There you go. It was, and on that day, it was very good. The end of the sixth day. And so all that God made was good. That man was given the assignment in Genesis chapter number one. So important. Key verse in your Bible. Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let us give him dominion or authority on the earth to tend it and to keep it. And so everything that God made, he put under Adam and his wife. Both of them together had dominion and authority, made in the image of God, given authority to carry out the will of God on the earth. And they named the animals so, and it was so distinctive, he had so much authority, whatever he called those animals is what they were. How come that's a hippopotamus? Because that's what he called it. Are you with me? Bird, fish, whatever. And he was calling it those things because the authority had been given to humanity. And as long as he was submitted to God, it all worked great. The problem is Genesis 3 happened. And the devil slithers into the garden into a perfect environment. And by the way, the devil's got no authority. I mean, literally, Adam could have said, you're a snake. Has God said, you shut up. Get. <laughs> could have been over. Problem is... Listen to the word of the devil. And this is always a problem. How many of you know when we listen to the devil, we always get in trouble? And so temptation was, and listen to this carefully, it was creating insecurity between God and man. And that's what the enemy always tries to do, distance you from God. Has God said, that's what he says in Genesis 3, he says, has God said God's just holding out on you that if you'll eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll not surely die, but you'll be as God. All right, now here's the question I want to ask with that regard. How much more like God can you get? You look like him. You walk like him. Everything else crawls on, on fours. He's on his feet. He's different. He knows it. He named everything. Does anything look like him? Nope, just isha. Total refinement. Are you with me? He's given authority, and all he has to do is submit everything to the Father, and everything is good. And suddenly, insecurity says, God's holding out on you, and if you'll do this, you'll be better off instead of worse off. Come on, the devil always overpromises and never delivers. And so the fall of humanity came. Suddenly, they knew that they were naked. The glory left their life, and suddenly they were exposed. And they knew for the first time that that God's presence is to be feared instead of welcome and embraced. God would one day restore the embrace, but right now sin created fear and fear and separation. And it's important for us to realize that in that moment, that God's holding out on you is a selfish orientation. Well, I don't want God to hold out on me. I want what's coming to me. And me becomes the center of that whole argument. 
See, the devil's always created the eye problem. And so it's important for you to realize today that if you're overly selfish, that you're more prone to falling like Adam did in the different topics of life. And so God would say, well, you know, if that happened, how come if God's all-knowing, why didn't he just prevent all of that and so forth and never allow the devil in the garden? Love requires a choice. I don't love you because I have to. I love you because I want to. And it makes the love deep and makes it real. And so God made it that way. And it's important for us to really understand how that, that whole thing works. And so with that choice, God gave Gave Adam authority, and with that authority, I'll just use the terminology because the Bible uses it so much, keys of authority. If you're authorized to go places and get in certain doors, that means you've got the key to get in there. Are you with me? So keys are authorization or authority. And so it's important for us to kind of get that picture because I'm going to use it several times. And so man was given the choice, and he chose wrongly. And so what did he do? He forfeited the keys. Okay, Adam, get it. Adam gets the keys from God, and he's got the authority in the earth. But then he steps over and submits to the devil and hands him the keys. And so who's got the keys then? With the fall of humanity, suddenly of the age of the authority or the jurisdiction on the earth, not the earth itself, but the jurisdiction on the earth, the, the devil gets Adam's keys, and so suddenly he's operating in authority that was given to him. And I can show you in your New Testament, you'll remember this, when Math, uh, Matthew's Gospel in chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus was, was um, baptized in the River Jordan, and he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Well, he shows up, and, he, and the third temptation that he gives to him is the devil leads him to a high mountain. And the Bible says there the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and the glory of them. And this is what the devil says to Jesus. Says, he says, all these kingdoms will I give to you, listen, for they were delivered unto me and anyone I want to give it to. I got the authority to give it away just like Adam gave it to me. He said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus just said, get behind me, Satan, for it is written. Come on, somebody. You'll worship the Lord our God and him only will you serve. And he departed. And so it's important for you to know that that dialogue even unpacks the idea of Genesis 3, that in Genesis, that he, Adam gave his authority away. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 4 says that the devil became the god of this world, small g, not capital G God, but small g God of this world, or God of this age is the word. And so he began to afflict, and he began to cause affliction. People get into agreement with the word of the devil, just like you can get in agreement with the word of the Lord. And you get into agreement with the word of the devil, and it's going to steal, kill, and destroy every single time. It's going to be filled with selfishness and with corruption and all the things that come. It's going to be filled with lies and half-truths and so forth. And the gossip, the, the number one gossip on the planet's the devil. And then he made Facebook. I'm just kidding. I, I'm just kidding. We're on Facebook. It's all right. Don't take us off. I was just kidding. But keys, keys, it's important for you to understand that the devil was authorized to walk on the earth because of the keys that he got from Adam. And so separation happened with God, when we disobeyed and we came out from underneath his covering and we stepped underneath and surrendered the keys to the devil. Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 17, God warned us. He said, in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll surely die. Well, he didn't physically die and his wife didn't physically die that day. It's talking about spiritual death, which by definition, spiritual death means separation from God. God is our life source. And though they lived over 900 years longer physically, they were dead spiritually or dead on the inside. And so here they are on the, on the world, life without God, alive in their bodies but dead in their spirit, and with the soul, a mind, a will, and the emotions that's trying to figure out how to walk through the oppression and the confusion of a fallen world without the light of revelation on, in his heart. So he's trying to do the best he can, and all he's 
God is recollections of the way it was instead of the living presence of God on the inside of him. And so life and the planet fell. And because of that, every malady known to humanity came because of the disobedience of one named Adam. Now, the Bible calls him the first Adam, but thank God Jesus is the last Adam. News at 11. It's important for us to grab a hold of the idea that God has got a plan for your life, and it doesn't have anything to do with this greasy grace sort of, you know, anything goes, kind of goes, and, you know, it's all kind of blamed on God, and God's micromanaging curses and blessings and all those kind of things that, that people kind of tend to believe. Well, God's going to do what he wants to do, and so, well, if that's true, how in the world are you going to walk by faith? Matter of fact, the Bible says, speak to the mountain, tell it to be removed and be thou cast in the sea. How do you know what mountain to tell that to? The mountain might be God. If God put the mountain there, you can't speak to it and tell it to move. You're resisting the will of God, like that aspirin I was telling that lady about and so forth. Again, what's faith for? Because the Word of God tells us what God's will is. What, what does God want? What did he promise? If you want perfect theology, look at Jesus. He's perfect theology. Amen. You know, it, it seemed like if sickness was the will of God, that Jesus would have walked at least into one town somewhere in Israel and made somebody sick for the will of God. Come on, if he's the perfect picture of the will of God. But every time he went into town, people that were sick got healed. Dead got raised. Amen. Unforgiven sinners got repentance and life transformations, and people that had packing critters <laughs> got deliverance. And so there's, there's the will of God. And so understand today, God promised to be a redeemer for us. And all the way back in Genesis 3, when God comes on the scene and confronts Adam, Eve, and the devil... He gives them all the perspective that comes with a fallen planet. God wasn't cursing them. He was just telling what came with the curse that came with the devil. And this is what he said to the, to the devil. He said, because you've done this, said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. So this talk, seed is talking about children or offspring, Okay. And so between, your, between you and the offspring of this woman, anybody ever heard of a virgin named Mary? And this is what he said, and you will bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. Now let me just tell you what bruise means. It means in the Hebrew language to crush or to shatter. And the word head just not only means your physical head, but it means headship or authority. And so the keys of the authority that you've gotten in this moment, he's going to come, the seed of the woman, the virgin-born son of God, is going to come, and he's going to crush what you got today. He is going to smash your authority. I'm getting excited. And so Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. As a matter of fact, the curse is what came on the earth, but Genesis, or excuse me, Galatians 3:13 says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse, all the, the, the difficulties and the, the maladies and the, the rejection, the bigotry, the poverty, the sickness, the disease, the disaster, the compromise, the lust and the greed that wants to capture your life. And Jesus broke its bands over your life. I'm not done with that yet. I'll be right back. But Jesus ended the curse's right to reign. Let me say it again. The curse has no right to reign over you. You ask me how I am on a daily basis, I'll tell you I'm blessed. What am I saying? I'm not cursed. I'm blessed. I walk in the blessing of God. By the way, Jesus redeemed me from the curse of the law, so I'm blessed. Amen? Because, see, there's a lot of people that are blessed by God because of faith in Jesus Christ, but they talk cursed. What they say is, for some unknown reason, I'm cursed. No, you're not. You're redeemed. No, you're not. You're blessed. You need your head to catch up with your heart and begin to declare the word of the Lord. Come on, what did Jesus do to the devil when he came and tried to afflict him three different times? It is written. And you've got to be able to put it as written on the devil. 
Matter of fact, there's been times like sickness and disease I didn't feel well. And I just said, devil, you're not going to get me off the word. I'm healed. Amen. Now my body was saying, no, you're not. You're sick. You're sick. You're sick. I said, nope. The word says I'm healed. By his stripes, I'm healed. And then it, when I didn't feel any better after all that, I just put my Bible on the floor and stood on it and said, you're never going to get me off the word. By his stripes, I'm healed. And I'm just standing, it was just an illustration, like a prophetic act for me, just simply to say, I'm not moving off the book, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry, I'm not moving off the book. I'm on the Word. And I'm going to stand on the Word of God, and devil, you are a liar. You're, all, you, you're the father of lies. I don't believe what you say. Matter of fact, you tell me something, I know the opposite's true, because you're a stinking liar. And so you've got to know that, otherwise... You just kind of lay down in front of every bondage and think it's God. Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it cleans up a lot of stuff for us. For the sin shall not have dominion over you. Dominion, what is dominion? It's authority. It's rulership, right? It's it, dominion. Sin shall not have dominion, right to rule is what dominion means, the right to rule over you. For you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Now, what grace did for you, Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. And so now in Jesus, all the law of Moses is fulfilled. And so by faith and grace, we walk in a freedom that we didn't have to earn. And we didn't get, get it by ten commandments. We got it by one. Walking in the love of God. Walking and receiving Jesus as Savior and the Lord of our lives. And because of his obedience, many became righteous. Amen. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do a thorough Bible study on this because there's so much more scriptures that I'm just tempted to go to. I'm not going. Amen. Discipline pastor. Amen. <laughs> but the, the dominion, sin shall not have dominion over you, Paul said. By the way, Romans 6, 1 says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Like Dr. Cottle used to tell us, may that thought die between your ears. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Sin's never going to be your friend, my friends. Sin is never your friend. Don't call it grace. It's bondage. And don't make a pet out of your sin and then condemn everybody else's. Just say it. Amen. We have a Redeemer. And it's, sin is not allowed to have dominion over your life. You, only when you surrender to it, just like Adam did to the devil. You just surrender to the temptation and off goes the authority. And so Matthew 8, 28, 18 says, Jesus said this, all authority has been given unto me where? In heaven and in earth. Jesus took the keys away from the devil. Somebody give me a good amen. amen. And so where did he find us? Man, we were lost. Ephesians 2 says that we all had our, he, he made us alive who once were dead in trespasses and in sin. Again, spiritual death is separation from God. And that's what kills us on the inside. Or 2 Corinthians 5.21 gives us that substitutionary idea about Jesus. And this is what it says, that he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, Jesus, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he became sin who knew no sin, placed on a cross. All of our sins he took with him because he was a sacrifice for us. So what did he give back if we gave him our sin? He gave us his right standing with God. Not because of law keeping, but because of his sacrifice. He pulled the judgment off of us and lavished grace upon you and I. And what I couldn't escape, Jesus took and then redeemed me and took me out of sin's dominion and today put me in the kingdom of God. And today that's where we are, living in the strong grace of God, living as children of God, living back in fellowship. The life of God comes back in us and we're born again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit moves back on the inside of us. Know you not, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that God dwells in you. Whew, you're his house. God, Listen, God don't want one temple in Jerusalem. He wants mobile homes that can go anywhere. They, your RV's for Jesus. Amen. Slap a high five with somebody and act like a hillbilly. Amen. Wahoo. So what's that mean to you and I? 
See, the Bible explains it very well. You don't live under the dominion of sin anymore. 1 John 3, 8. Man, don't forget that one. 1 John 3, 8 says, For, for he who sins is of the devil, for sin, the devil sinned from the beginning. But for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Why did he come? To get him off of your life. To set you free and to put you on a brand new track filled with purity and God's holiness and the joy and freedoms that come in the beautiful Holy Spirit. Man, that's the way it comes. And so, so many passages of Scripture. Colossians 2. Man, you talk about a refrigerator scripture. This is it. If you want to walk in new creature realities of what God has done in your life, this is the one you need to underscore. Because Colossians chapter number 2 just really nails this, and I'm pardon the pun, but you'll understand in just a second. You being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him. When he got up, you got up. When he rose from the dead, you rose with him. Having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out. Come on, somebody shout, wipe out. Wipe out. Woo. Having wiped out the handwriting and the ordinances and the requirements that were against us, that were contrary to us. Come on, the devil could point to a thousand things in my life and said, but Pat did that. You can't bless him. Look what he did. He gave place to me. He did exactly what I told him to do. And then they did what they, what, as a result, they, they, did, they got mad and started afflicting people around them. It spread like a virus because of what Pat did. He hit him and the guy wanted to hit him back and he did all that. You can't bless him. He's nasty. took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. It was contrary to me. He took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. And then he not only did that, but then he, my problem was the devil. And he says, he disarmed principalities and powers and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. His triumph was my, listen, Jesus didn't need victory. I'm the one that needed it. He didn't get his own. He bought mine. He wasn't buying his own victory. He didn't need to come for his own victory. He needed to come and get mine and yours. And thank God when he rose from the dead, bless God, resurrection life was released into the planet. Just like the curse was released with Adam's disobedience through the obedience of one, the Bible says, Romans 5, 17, through the obedience of one, many will be made righteous. The Bible says those who are alive in Christ will reign in life through one Jesus Christ. Now you can walk by faith because you know the score. You know who's been defeated. You know where the devil's coming from. You know what he's trying to do. And you can say, in the name of Jesus, I arrest that. Why? Because I got keys. Keys of authority. Jesus was asking his disciples one day, who do you say I am? Who am I to you? When some, he said, they responded, some say you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. He said, but who do you say I am? Now, here's where the rubber hits the road, because you can't walk in my faith. you got to walk in yours. And Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And listen to what Jesus said. Come on, we've been talking about keys. He said... He said, flesh and blood didn't give that to you, but you got that from the Father. And from now on, you're not Simon, you're Peter. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. The word Peter means Petra's rock. It's not building it on Peter. It's the rock of revelation. It's the rock of hearing from God and walking in the identity of who Jesus Christ is. It's not Peter. Amen. Amen. Sorry if you're an ex-Catholic, that may upset you, but <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> so we can go into original language if you want. I'll talk to you later, and you'll not be mad anymore. Amen. <laughs> but this is what the Word says. He said, 
Upon this rock, I will build my church. This ability to hear from God and decree the Messiah. Hear from God, decree the Messiah. Walk in revelation and decree the Messiah. He said, I'll build my church on that, and the gates of hell won't be able to keep you out. You're going to take ground back from the devil. You're not holding the fort. You're taking one. And he said, behold, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. I'm giving you the keys. That is so powerful. That he said, whatever you lock up is locked. Whatever you loose is is loose. And so have good sense enough to lock up the devil and release the blessing of God in your life. Amen. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it will eat the fruit thereof. Don't curse yourself with your own lips. Use your keys to unlock the captives. Use your keys. Use your lips to be able to declare the word of the Lord. Declare freedom to the captives. Hallelujah. Everybody needs to know this message. And so let me finish up this magnificent message. Why do bad things still happen if all of that's true? And I can just tell you right now, people are still getting into agreement with a liar. If you believe the lie, you empower the liar. And that's, he's, he's running on borrowed authority. The devil still usurps authority from people. And if you yield to the devil, you just kind of become the mouthpiece, just like you can yield to God and become his prophetic mouthpiece in the earth. And that's what God's people are supposed to be. We're supposed to be heralding the good news of the gospel, all of us together, every day, all of us together. You say, that sounds a little fanatical. No, you just need to be born again, and you'll be a fanatic like me. You just need to know that there's a consequence to leaving people in the curse because the curse won't stay in them. They'll pass it out. Cursed people pass out their evangelists for the devil. But we can't rescue them. Come on, how many of you know the apostle Paul used to be a terrorist? Saul of Tarsus was putting believers in jail just because of their religious differences and so forth and separating families and killing people. And all of a sudden God met him on the road to Damascus and took the curse and made him into a blessing. Could he do that for anybody? He sure can. And so God can do that in the earth. And let me just tell you today that there's still curse in the earth, but I want you to know whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And that you're authorizing the authority of the name of Jesus. And today you can walk in that authority and dominion in the name of Jesus. Today, the things that I've shared with you, they've been in the Bible for thousands of years. And you're permitted to walk in all of the things that I've just shared with you. Stop blaming God for your problem and start calling him your answer. Jesus has never been your problem. Say, but I called upon him. I was in trouble and he didn't help me. Yeah, but the consequences of really bad decisions and of oppression, again, the curse doesn't stay in the cursed person. They pass it out. There's one way to fix it. The same way you came out. The devil might have ruined a really big day of your life, and it's ruined a portion of your life. And I just want you to know I understand because I've had that same thing happen to me. But you don't have to let a bad day ruin the rest of your life today. That stuff will slide off of you like the chains of bondage that sin offers. And today you're allowed to walk free in the name of Jesus. Come on, I'm telling you, I'm standing before people who have been abused. I'm standing before people who have been cheated. I'm standing before folks who've been beaten by their own parents, and I just want you to know something today, that today that, that will only serve the purposes of God later because you don't have to stay in bondage. You don't have to stay in anger and bitterness. The, the memories still haunt me. Well, bless God, use it as a testimony. Stand on it and preach a delivering power of a Savior who rose from the dead. If he can beat death, he can beat that. You don't have to identify with that anymore. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed means that I buried the bondage. I buried it in the baptistry. I left it at the bottom of the pool. And when I came out, I came out free. I came out clean. I came out victorious. And I became somebody who I couldn't have been by myself. And no one can take my victory from me. And no one can take your victory from you. You have to give it away. Holy Spirit gave you joy. And so you're permitted to live in it even if you're living by faith in it. Nobody's allowed to take my joy. I'm keeping mine. 
Come on, I know you've met Sister Sandpaper and she roughed a little hide off of you. And Brother Bucketmouth, who spoke all kinds of lies about you. Come on, I know that happens. Okay? Come on, it can happen in the church for you. Not this one. We'd kick people out of here for that. (laughs) You ain't coming back here, boy. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm just kidding. Kidding. But it hurts. Welcome to planet Earth. People are not perfect yet. You're not. Still working on it. But here's the good news. You don't have to stay where you are. You have permission to proceed in the victory of Jesus. You have permission from the Father to be like Him. You have permission to be like Jesus. For whom God did foreknow, Romans 8, 29. For whom God did foreknow, he also did predestine to become conformed to the image of his son. That he might be called the firstborn among many brethren. And that's us. I'm a child of God. The devil hates it. I love it. If you're not a child of God yet, and by the way, that's no accident. The invitation is to him. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Jesus said, I'll give you rest. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, and I mean call from the standpoint of knowing what I just told you, today you'll find brand new life in Jesus Christ. Today can be that day for you. Bow your heads with me, and those of you online, join me in prayer in just a moment. If you're listening to this message, you're saying, man, I need a new beginning in my life. It's exactly why Jesus came. He came to make you new and to jerk the curse off of your life and to bring you under the Father's blessing. And that's what He wants for you. It doesn't mean life gets easy. It just means there's an answer in the midst of life's challenges. And we walk by faith in the promises of God. And God does miracles for His people who stand on His Word. And so today, let it be no mystery to you. You have an enemy. And he's here to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have abundantly. Now the choice is vividly clear. Do you want life or death, blessing or cursing? Choose life. If that's you, wherever you're at right now, you're one prayer, one moment, one conviction, one decision away from stopping the chaos and bringing peace and joy into your life. And it starts right here. Pray this prayer with me right now. All of us in together, pray this prayer with me. And God will change your life. In a moment, I'll ask you a question, but pray this with me. Dear God in heaven, I come in the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world. You came for me. Thank you that you died in my place. And then you rose from the dead. Come into my life. Be the Lord of who I am. I surrender to you. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive me now and that you change the course of my life. I'm blessed, and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, give me a good amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Woo! Hallelujah. Hey, thanks for joining us here at Living Word Church Online. If you made the choice to follow Jesus today, congratulations. You just made the best decision of your life. But we don't want you to walk this new path alone. God designed us to be in a community and to help each other. So we want to help you grow in your new faith. Click the raise hand button in your chat box and we'll make sure to help you with your next steps. Or if you're joining us on Facebook, you can text HOPE to the number on your screen. It's God's job to save you, but He's trusted us to help guide you in this brand new faith journey. Here at Living Word, we're all about taking next steps. And whether you're a brand new Christian or you've been following Jesus for a long time, we all have a next step we can take. We want to encourage you to take your next step, no matter what it is. If you'd like to find a group of people to help you grow in your faith, your next step is to join a life group. Life is better when we spend it together. Or maybe you feel like joining our dream team and serving others. Lifetrack would be your next step. Lifetrack is our way to help you find the path from potential to purpose and make a difference in the world around you. 
Or it could be that your next step is to trust God with your finances. All the ways you can partner with us in growing God's kingdom are on your screens now. All of these next steps and more can be found in our mobile church app. Download it today by texting DLWC app to 77977. We hope you take what God spoke to you today into the coming week and make a difference in your world. We love you, we're for you, and we'll see you next Sunday right here at Church Online.